Hi, everyone. My name is Dr. Jonathan Ali. I'm the toxicologist with the New Hampshire Department of Environmental Services, and I'm going to go over health, expo health risk and exposure concerns related to PFAS compounds. So to start with, I just want to let everyone know that I work for the State Department of Environmental Services, but within this role, we also collaborate with partners at the Department of Health and Human Services, including Division of Public Health Services, as well as federal partners at the Agency for Toxic Substances and Disease Registry. A couple months ago, I believe in December, we came out and gave a presentation about this collaboration and how some of its work can be used to help your community address concerns and also identify potential issues that maybe we could help with in the future. So to start with, our main concern for exposure to PFAS is through ingestion. So when we think about any chemical, its risk is usually driven by how we're exposed to it, how it can get into our body. Once it's in the body, that's where we have concern for it having some sort of activity that can cause harm. With PFAS, the primary source of exposure or the route of exposure that we're concerned with is through ingestion. So that can either be ingestion of drinking water or contaminated food items. A lot of research has gone into this, and this is actually how we understand a lot of exposure factors related to PFAS compounds. We also understand that exposure can occur in infants and fetuses where certain PFAS can transfer across the placenta into fetuses who are then born with PFAS in their body. And some of them can be transferred across in breast milk to breastfed infants. So again, that breastfeeding reiterates the risk for exposure from ingestion. There is some potential risk and some research going on right now trying to understand the risk from inhalation or partial ingestion of PFAS from dust. So at this time, a lot of the research is focused on inhalation risk related to dust that carry PFAS on them. So this could be dust from household products as they break down and if they contain PFAS or any kind of stain resistant treatment. That dust can either be inhaled and gradually ingested or for small infants and toddlers if they're doing sort of hand crawling behaviors and then put those hands into their mouth that's another way that those can be ingested right now there's very limited research but from what we understand certain pfas are poorly absorbed across the skin and this includes long chain pfas like pfoa and pfos some studies have found that exposure can occur across the skin, but it's at much higher concentrations than what we see in groundwater. And it's typically seen situations where you have specifically foams developing, or in the case of firefighters, where they're actually interacting with AFFF or aqueous film forming foams. One of the biggest concerns about exposure is that certain PFAS are bioaccumulative. And this means that exposure to small amounts will build up over time because our body is very effective at retaining these chemicals within us. Some chemicals we can break down and eliminate from our body very quickly. PFAS is not amongst those. So for certain PFAS, they do accumulate very well in the body. Other PFAS, it appears they do not. So because of this, this is one of the reasons that we set these low standards for the long chain PFAS that we're currently regulating because evidence suggests that these are very bioaccumulative. So those standards are listed here and this is just a reiteration of what Mike Wimsett showed earlier. But one of the things to remember is that these limits were developed for the most sensitive segment of the population. So this is pregnant and lactating women in order to protect their infants. Those same individuals who consume high volumes of water on a regular basis and individuals with chronic exposure or that would be using the water for a chronic period of time, so for several years to decades. And additionally, these, fact, these standards are reduced lower than what they might be to account for sources of exposure other than drinking water. So things like commercial products that maybe we interact with that could have some exposure, household dust, and possibly some background contamination from certain food products that might also accumulate these chemicals. For more information about how these standards are derived and the science that's behind them, you can follow this link. Um, I'm aware that this is sort of repetitious for several residents that are on this call today as we're very interactive with Merrimack in the process, but for those that aren't familiar, we have additional information available. So there are some health risks that have been associated with PFAS, and this is still an evolving area of science, but some of the key health effects that have been identified and recognized by the Agency for Toxic Substances and Disease Registry include increases in cholesterol levels, 
changes in certain liver enzyme levels, slight changes to infant birth weight, some alterations to the immune system function, some risk of preeclampsia, changes in thyroid and reproductive hormones. So if you're thinking of thyroid hormone, but reproductive hormones include like testosterone and estrogen. And there have been some studies that have suggested a potential association to certain cancers, but this has usually been in populations with significantly high exposures. So these studies are currently always coming out every couple of weeks, every couple of months. We're seeing new studies that come out on PFAS and associated health effects. Some health effects, the evidence goes back and forth. Other ones, it's strengthened. Other ones, not so much. This is something that us, federal partners, and other states continue to monitor. But additionally, ATSDR is currently undergoing a large nationwide study to try to understand what are the risks from exposure in communities that have had drinking water exposure. A lot of this has focused on communities with AFFF or aqueous film, form, aqueous film forming foam contamination. So with the goal of this being that in time, we'll actually look back, understand what the effects were and be able to inform other communities that have had exposure through drinking water. This is constantly evolving area of research, but more information can be found at their website. You can also reach out to us and we're happy to connect you with information that we're seeing. So one of the things I wanted to take some time and do was answer some frequently asked questions that we're getting from a lot of community members, both in Merrimack and in other towns have been impacted. One of the first things is where can my physician learn more about PFAS and my family's risk? Understandably, there is frustration because physicians are not toxicologists. They're barely pharmacists half the time. So understanding the risk of chemicals to your health can be a tricky subject for them. There are some resources available at the New Hampshire Department of Health and Human Services website, as well as through the Agency for Toxic Substances and Disease Registry. If your physician's unfamiliar with these or they have some questions, either I or staff at DHHS can help them out. One of the things to remember though, is this is also an evolving area of research and science. There is currently a national panel that's actually trying to understand if we can develop specific guidance for physicians related to evaluating risk from exposure and what that means for patients' clinical outcomes. Right now, the science is a little tenuous on that and it's difficult for physicians to make those kind of calls and make changes to a patient's health or to their healthcare plans. This is constantly evolving. We're hoping that we'll get more information in the next year. You've also had residents from your own community that have testified before these national panels provide insights and perspectives. For that, we're grateful, but we're also keeping an eye on this to see how it changes. Another frequent question is, is there a test to measure PFAS in blood? And the answer is yes, but it's complicated. The same bill that was passed that codified our drinking water standards into law also required health insurance companies to pay for PFAS blood testing. If you go to a physician and ask for this, they may be unfamiliar with it. So you'll need to be patient. You also need to have a conversation with the physician to see if they're comfortable with ordering that kind of test. At this time, there's no determined level of PFAS in your blood that would trigger action by a physician other than to make the recommendation of test your well and try to reduce your exposure. So some physicians may not be comfortable with ordering a test without knowing a diagnostic value. That's a conversation to have with your physician. If they're wanting additional information, we have links available. They can also reach out to academic partners in the region. The poison control centers can also direct them to other information. So it is complicated. Testing is available, but it is a tricky subject and it's a conversation you want to have directly with your primary care physician. So can I cook with the water? It's another common question that we're getting. And basically if you're above the standards, we wouldn't recommend that you cook with the water. Boiling does not remove PFAS. You cannot cook these out of the water. And in fact, you may concentrate it somewhat into certain food products, depending on what you're preparing with the water. Since ingestion is the primary route of exposure, you'll be increasing your overall exposure if you're using this to cook certain food items. Another question is about, can we use the water for bathing, showering, cleaning? Our standards are based on the use of water for ingestion, so use as drinking water. For these other levels or these other uses of water, 
no level has been determined for those. However, because of how poorly these are absorbed through skin, these are considered lower risk activities. So for these other purposes, and just bear in mind that you know, sometimes general cleaning products may contain certain PFAS items, most of the levels that we see in residential wells are not really considered a high risk activity for these uses. Another question is, can I irrigate my home garden that has fruits and vegetables using this water? Again, we reiterate these standards were based on drinking water consumption. There's still very little that's understood about how PFAS are taken up by certain forms of plants. We do understand that plants interact with PFAS differently than animals do, and that makes it more complicated to give very concrete advice on is a certain level in your well going to be safe for a certain plant that you're growing. There has been some attempt to understand this in studies around the world and their areas impacted by PFAS, but as Jeff Marks mentioned earlier, we do have an issue where soil type affects how these move. So depending on the interactions a certain PFAS compound or suite of compounds have with the soil, it may affect how well they're taken up by plants. And at this time, we don't have that information to make an accurate assessment. Similarly, can I irrigate the water with my lawn or thinking about sort of skin contact if there's residues? Again, these are meant for drinking water standards and due to the considered lower risk from the skin contact, it's not considered a major pathway of exposure. We also just remind people if you're using any other kind of lawn care products or if there's other irritants, so just not just weeds, other items like that, you do want to be mindful of that and other things you might come in contact with in those settings. We also get questions about pets. There's still very little that's understood about how PFAS may affect pets, especially things like cats, dogs, and certain hobby fish. What we do understand though is, again, with most other animals, Ingestion is the primary source of exposure, but we also understand that you know animals might get ingestion from a different way. So if you have treated fabrics, other materials, or dust in your household that contain PFAS, then pets may have exposure through that route as they go around, lay on objects, and groom themselves. For most aquatic species, there's not a lot of information, but the best place to start for any concerns related to your pet is having a conversation with your veterinarian about any health concerns you have. And if they are sure that it's not caused by something else, either in the environment, in the home, or just predisposed for that species. If you'd like extra information, or if your veterinarian like extra information, I'm happy to provide them with any studies that we have that be related to your concern. And you can use my contact information at the end of this presentation. And then finally, are there limits for other PFAS compounds? So depending on the estimate, you can have several between two to 7,000, depending on which reference you use, but there's a lot of different kinds of PFAS that have been identified. We're not sure about how many are actually in the environment as testing methods keep changing, but right now I only have standards for four of these compounds. And that's based on the availability of evidence to determine that they do pose a risk. There are other compounds in the environment and we are continuing to assess that information to see if we can improve risk assessment and provide that guidance. But at this time, we're working off of these four compounds to identify areas of risk. So just another resource I wanted to throw out there for everyone is our apple tree program. It's the world's longest acronym and I'm sorry for that. But this program is specifically focused at addressing community concerns and helping them to reduce exposures. So we try to gather information, identify issues, and work with the community to identify solutions if possible. We have a great team that's working on this. They've recently started up in the last few months. We have a presentation we did for Merrimack that's available by recording. But if you have any additional questions about this program or how we can be of service, you can reach out to Karen Craver, who's our principal investigator, using the information below. Or if you forget that in the meantime, feel free to call me as well.